The traffic sounds typical of modern Jerusalem can be heard even here among these Corinthian columns dating back to the Byzantine era. We're in the Jewish quarter, one of the hubs of the old city. The quarter is a museum, a bazaar, a holy place, an urban area that still bears signs of almost all the phases of the destruction and reconstruction of Jerusalem. Rebuilt by Rome on the ruins of a military outpost it had established there, Jerusalem today reflects contrasting realities, its places of prayer intermingling with modern neighborhoods. The owner of this house, Kathros, was a wealthy man and a member of a priestly family. The fire was sudden and devastating. Perhaps no one survived it. Escape, on the other hand, was impossible in those days. In just a few years, the bureaucratic structure of the conquerors, which had made it possible for a series of corrupt governors to hold power, would be reformed. The orders of Emperor Titus were enforced to the letter. The year was 70 AD, just a few decades after the death of Jesus. Darkness and silence enveloped the house of Kathros. Today, the neglect of centuries has proven fortuitous. Excavations reveal that the dwelling was made up of several rooms, one of which has been left the way the archaeologists found it. The walls of the building still bear signs of the fire which destroyed the temple and entire sections of the city in 70 AD. Household utensils such as jars, cups and bowls fashioned from clay or stone litter the site. They're all that remain of what might once have been a kitchen, a workshop, and perhaps a small ritual bath. Some of the objects are expertly crafted, while others are rough home. They tell us how the homes of Jerusalem were furnished back in the first century AD, but the ovens and crockery provide us with more than just scientific information. Perhaps the people who lived in these rooms spoke about Jesus. Perhaps the head of the house, Kathros, who was probably getting on in years, was an eyewitness to the events in which the Galilean played a central role. Perhaps more than one member of the household ran outside that day, attracted by the excitement in the streets, to join the crowd that was headed toward Bethphage and Bethany, close by the Mount of Olives. Or perhaps one of the members of the family added his voice to the throng shouting, Crucify him. Today, as then, ritual purifications for the feast begin several days ahead of time. For the Jews, preparing for the Passover means above all getting rid of every crumb of leavened bread and eating only unleavened bread in remembrance of the events recorded in the scriptures. The people are to eat this unleavened bread hastily, it is written, with a girdle around their waist, sandals on their feet, and a staff in hand, as befitting people ready to flee. The lamb is to be roasted over the fire, head, feet, and entrails, and must be consumed entirely, leaving nothing for the next morning. Of all the feast days in the Hebrew calendar, the Passover is the most sacred, the most fervently celebrated. 
It should be savored as one savors an olive, the Talmud says. The Passover is a joyful feast, but also a time of meditation, because it commemorates the flight of the Hebrews from Egypt and their liberation from slavery, crucial events in the history of this people. The Samaritan community still exists today, even though it's by now reduced to just a few hundred members who continue the old observances. They have preserved their own rituals, which differ from those observed by the Jews in general. The festivities include ceremonies that embody ancient traditions. The Passover rite is fixed by the scriptures. Today, the community celebrates this rite in a colorful, even passionate way. It's late afternoon on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, which falls between the months of March and April in the Western calendar. Back in those days, everything took place in front of the temple. The assembled lambs are by now all selected and paid for as required by the law, and those about to perform the sacrifices are ready, along with the whole community of Israel. The priests collect the blood of the lambs and pour it out in front of the altar, as was done in the past, when its flow was channeled toward the Kidron Valley through a system of conduits. The Passover, or better, its preparation, to use Luke's expression, has almost reached its most expressive sacrificial moment. Today, as in times past, the inner organs and the fat of the animals are thrown on the fire to be consumed. The acrid smell of burning flesh permeates the air and lingers over the city for a long time. The sacrificed lambs are carried away by their donors for the ritual meal, which is eaten at home, in an upper room if possible. show you a large upper room furnished with couches. Make the preparations there. The noise from the neighborhoods around the temple is muffled, indistinct. A strange tension permeates the atmosphere, almost a forewarning of the overwhelming sadness to come. The actions of Jesus seem to indicate that a great drama is about to take place. Something very serious is about to happen. Something that belongs to the kingdom of life and at the same time also to the kingdom of death. It must not be during the festivities. Otherwise there will be a disturbance among the people, warn the chief priests and scribes assembled in the palace of the high priest. Life and death. Once again, Jesus hastens to complete an action, one of his last. The entrance is almost directly in front of the Zion Gate, one of the busiest gates in Jerusalem. The small courtyard is paved with stone markers identifying the graves of the Armenian patriarchs. From here, a few steps lead to a lane, which almost immediately feeds into a trail. Its neglected state makes walking difficult. Dense undergrowth has by now almost obliterated the original path and serves to conceal the traces of an old and imposing home. According to tradition, this is the site of the house of Caiaphas, located just outside the city walls, 
a site that by the 3rd century AD was already attracting pilgrims. The house was about 30 meters long. At one time, it must have boasted beautifully painted walls and floor mosaics laid out in elegant geometrical designs. A courtyard stood at the center of the building. The house had many baths filled by either rainwater or spring water and used for ritual purposes. These are not the ruins of a simple home, but of an impressive residence. The chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and made plans to arrest Jesus by some trick and have him put to death. Approaching Jerusalem from the Kidron Valley, the southwest slope of the city appears to be peaceful, illuminated here and there by the campfires of pilgrims who have come to celebrate the Passover. In both houses and tents, everything is ready. The same can be said of the chamber where the Last Supper is about to take place. Today, the Cenacle is situated on the second floor of a large complex known as the Tomb of David. Constructed in the Gothic style, the room is bare and austere. Nothing remains of the original site except a stone reminding visitors that it was here, on Mount Zion, that the members of the newborn church first gathered. Jesus got up from the table, removed his outer garment, and taking a towel, wrapped it around his waist. He then poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel he was wearing. For the first time, a master washes the feet of his disciples, and the action has the sacrificial value of an offering. The hour of Jesus in preparation for such a long time begins with an action that is shocking because it is that of a slave. At the moment, you do not know what I am doing, Jesus says to Peter, but later you will understand. I have given you an example so that you may do what I have done to you. Pesachim, which describes the Jewish Passover rite in minute detail, is still consulted today in preparing the Paschal meal. The atmosphere is joyous, as in any friendly gathering, except for the ritual manner in which the food and drink are served. The Psalms, recounting the flight of the chosen people from the land of the Pharaoh, are read. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a foreign nation, Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his domain. Praise Yahweh, all nations. Extol him, all you peoples. The feast day is blessed. The first cup of wine and water is drunk. Then comes the meal itself. The guests are offered unleavened bread, bitter herbs in the form of lettuce, basil, and wild endive, dipped in a sauce made of figs, dates, raisins, apples, and almonds. 
And finally, the roasted shank bone of lamb or goat. One cup of wine follows another, four in all according to tradition. It's a time for remembering, for retelling the story of those long ago events. The sauce served at table recalls the mortar for the bricks that the ancestors of the Jews were forced to make during their time of slavery in Egypt. The bitter herbs are a reminder of their sufferings. The unleavened bread is prepared as it was at the time of the flight from Pharaoh. The lamb symbolizes the people of Israel to whom God gave the tablets of the law. The people chant, Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his domain. The sea flooded the site, the Jordan stopped flowing, the mountains skipped like rams and like lambs, the hills. The supper in which Jesus participated probably followed a ritual similar to this one. The long colonnades surrounding the temple are deserted. Sounds of an animated discussion can clearly be heard in the distance. It comes from the house of the high priest, Caiaphas. The words of Jesus are repeated one by one. We should have stopped him. We shouldn't have been afraid of the crowd, a number of people say. filled with admiration when he said, give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God, someone comments. When he said, the first of all the commandments is to love the Lord your God, and the second is to love your neighbor as yourself, no one dared to question him, several people add. And don't forget his insolence. Just a short distance from here, on the holy ground of the temple, when he said to us, the tax collectors and prostitutes will make their way into the kingdom of God before you. Or when he stopped for a drink of water at Jacob's well in Samaria, the land of our enemies, and spent some time talking to a local woman. He probably had a meal there too, one of the scribes hints darkly. Whoever eats the bread of Samaritans eats the flesh of swine, vigorously asserts an old Pharisee, quoting a saying he'd learned as a child. Kill him. We have to kill him. But not during the festivities. There must be no disturbance among the people, the members of the Sanhedrin conclude resolutely. Outside, the temperature has dropped several degrees. Then Jesus took some bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. After supper, he did the same with the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be poured out for you. The ancient Passover ritual reaches its final and definitive fulfillment. The body is given for you. The blood is poured out for you. Jesus realizes that his death is imminent. He foresees his return to the Father. The traditional gestures remain unchanged, but they are enriched by symbolism and new meaning. Do this in memory of me, Jesus says. During the meal, Judas leaves the room.
A mournful wind sweeps through the Kidron Valley, across the ground littered with stones and bathed in the last rays of the setting sun. It swirls around the funerary monuments of Absalom, Josephat, Jacob and Zechariah, and then spirals higher up toward the hills. The route that Jesus and his disciples take is a short one. All you have to do is descend into the valley, follow one of the trails that lead to its opposite side, and there, even today, not far from an ancient Muslim cemetery, you will find a small estate at the foot of a hill covered with olive trees. Gethsemane, or Gethsemane, means olive press. Jesus used it as a regular meeting place. He came to a small estate called Gethsemane, as usual, Luke says, with his disciples following him. Even though ancient, the olive trees are not the same ones that grew at the time of Jesus, but the garden is the same. Some very ancient olive trees still grow in this garden, wrote the 16th century pilgrim Zuallardo. He took Peter, James and John with him, and a sudden fear came over him and great distress, and he said to them, Wait here and keep awake. Jesus is about to complete his mission. The end is near. My soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Nevertheless, let your will be done, Father, not mine, he concludes. Jesus moves apart from his disciples. About a stone's throw away, he knelt down and prayed, the evangelist Luke records, and his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. The Garden of Gethsemane and the caves scattered around the area form the backdrop of this great drama and of a man's fear. disciples have fallen asleep. Jesus is alone, exhausted. He staggers and then falls prostrate on the ground. The dialogue between father and son is agonizing. The temptation to yield is powerful. Why give light to a man of grief? to a man who does not see his way, whom God balks on every side. Job cried out from the midst of his sufferings. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The upright man asks in the psalm. Helpless and weak in the sight of the Almighty, the Son of God who took on human nature becomes the model of the true believer. The hour has come for God to carry out his plan of salvation for all humanity in a definitive way. So now, do with me as you will. Be pleased to take my life from me, Tobit prays, sad at heart. It is all over. The hour has come. Now the Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us go. Things happen quickly. Judas greets Jesus with a kiss, the customary salute between disciple and master. But this time, the kiss is a prearranged signal. 
Gethsemane, usually deserted at that hour, is suddenly filled with people. A number of men, Luke says, all armed with swords and clubs, Mark elaborates. A group of soldiers, together with a detachment of guards sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, John remembers. The light cast by the flickering torches barely illuminates the scene. Few words are spoken. Whom do you seek? Jesus asks. Jesus the Nazarene, they respond. I am he.